Yes, yes, I am. I am. I should invite all of you over. I mean, um, I'll, 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 I'll talk a little bit about it later, but I should invite all of you over. I mean, it's a very short talk of, of just one hour, four of us squeeze in, uh, plus Sarah. That's going to be five. Uh, so after that, we should all catch up, I think. Yeah, so, soon, yeah. soon you'll be able to take it. Hi, <laughs> <laughs> Lorraine, is it? Lorraine or? Lauren. Lauren. I can Lauren, hear, you. Can't hear you. Uh, I think you have to unmute. I, you, you're not coming through, Lauren. You're not coming through. We can't hear you. You need to unmute. Maybe in the own. The okay. Top. Am I unmuted now? Yes. Am I live? Yeah. <laughs> Great. 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 It's nice to talk to you. It's been fun hearing you. I'm also working from home, but uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, perhaps perhaps partially ready for for a bit more time back together with the team. Everybody's room looks far better than mine. Look at mine. Uh, it's actually the cat's oh, room. So <laughs> yeah, so I had to evict the cat so that I could get some privacy for myself. And the cat is not you happy. Show the cat. The, the the cat escaped. I I let him out. Otherwise, he'll be trapped in here with me, and he'll be he'll be meowing nonstop. So so I had to I had to evict him from his own room. Whoops! Twenty five seconds left. Twenty four seconds. Yeah. Well, we need some ecology down here. Let's let's get your cat in. <laughs> no no no! You do not want my cat in. <laughs> All I have is a clay wolf. Uh, yeah. It's just behind me, right? Uh, the plants will do. The plants will do. Well, that, that, that's a standard M-Box uh, decoration. <laughs> oh, no, no. Actually, the outside of my house is very nice. Plan for yeah. This to be frank, right? yeah it's, it's very nice. I, I like Thank it so much. All right, are we live? Welcome everyone. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, and good morning. Uh, thank you all panelists and audience members for joining us online. If you do so, could you please answer the poll questions that are on your screen to help us get a better sense of who's here with us today? My name is Sari Ichioka, and I'm Director of Desire Lines, which is an international consultancy for environmental, cultural, and social impact organizations and initiatives. I'd like to start out by offering my thanks to Anna Pam Yogg for inviting me to curate and moderate this session, and also to Donna Lee and Shireen Marikan for working so hard behind the scenes and against multiple logistical and technical challenges in order to bring us together for today's event. Now, our panel has a world city stage and a wild city frame. Over the past year around the world, many of our cities have dramatically slowed the pace and volume of their human activity. And as they've done so, many have made space for non-human elements of nature to creep back in. From the sound of birdsong and skies free from airplanes, to the proliferation of wildflowers or weeds, depending on your perspective, on CBD sidewalks. A positive side effect of this otherwise unwelcome global pandemic may be an enhanced human awareness of our immediate surroundings and a revaluing of the presence of nature in all of our lives. One of my favorite writers on the topic of rewilding, the remarkable Isabella Tree, describes the first stage of her family estates return to nature in this way. The land, released from its cycle of drudgery, seemed to be breathing a sigh of relief. As the land relaxed, so did we. Obviously, Tree is writing here about intensive agriculture, but I found this passage resonated with my own understanding of lands, urban landscapes that may be subject to very intensive maintenance regimes of their own. In this spirit, I'd like to invite each of you listening to turn away from your screen for a moment, 
Close your eyes, take a deep breath, and think about an urban green space you use or pass through or by on a regular basis. Picture in your mind your favorite plant growing in that space. What does that plant smell like? What time of year is it at its peak? And then casting your mind's eye around that same space, what was the last non-human animal you encountered there? Bonus points for those of you who can think of an animal that wasn't a dog or a cat. So while our panel today will specifically discuss experiences of urban nature in Singapore, where we're all based, I hope that you, the audience, will keep your own experiences in mind while you're listening to us. How can what our experts share help you think about how to bring more wilderness or wildness into your own urban environment? So joining us today to discuss this topic, we're lucky to have four Singapore-based experts on cities and urban greenery. I'll introduce all of them briefly now uh, in the order of their presentations, and then we'll flow directly into those. After the four presentations, we'll hopefully have some time left over for Q&A. So if any, question, if any questions arise in your mind while we're speaking, um, please share them, feel free to share them via the chat box. So first up, we have, we'll have Lim Liang Jim, who's group director of the National Biodiversity Center at Singapore's National Parks Board. Jim's team of officers are responsible for biodiversity conservation in Singapore, and they administer the Nature Conservation Master Plan, which is the comprehensive action plan that he'll tell us more about today. Second up, we'll have Lauren Sorkin, who's executive director of the Resilient Cities Network. Headquartered in Singapore with offices in Mexico City and New York City, RCN bring together global knowledge, practice, partnerships, and funding to empower their members to build safe and equitable cities for all. Then we'll hear from Chang Hui Yan, who founded the landscape design firm Salad Dressing here in Singapore in 2002. Salad dressing consists of landscape designers, gardeners, and architects who challenge boundaries in the design of domesticated landscapes based on the rainforest, biodiversity, very poetically, the immateriality of nature and its relationship with humans. And finally, we will hear from Professor Yunhui Huang, who's associate professor at the National University of Singapore. She's an accredited landscape architect and a landscape researcher with expertise in socio-ecological socio design and management strategies that respond to the emerging demands of high-density cities. So Jim, I would love to hand the microphone over to you. Thank you so Thank much, you so Sarah. Much, Sarah. Uh, and uh, welcome everyone to uh, this panel. And nice, nice to meet all of you. And congratulations to everybody who's stayed on at the World City Conference all the way from when it first started, which I think probably was 8 a.m. our time. Um, so I shall start off with uh, basically an introduction of what Singapore is and how it looks like and how it got there. Uh, and, and it's actually a very interesting story. And I've tried to distill uh, how we got to where we were uh, or where we are right now um, uh, and distill all the fundamentals behind how the Singapore government managed to pull it off. Along the way, I'll also have a little bit of discussion about uh, what, what are the challenges that we face along the way. It shouldn't take long. I only have 10 slides, but, uh, but look at this first slide. And, and it's really, really a city unlike any other in the world. Uh, first of all, look at the environment that circumscribes Singapore, right? And the, the, the environment that we find ourselves in uh, socially, politically, economically, right? We are an island. We only have 710 square kilometers. It's very, very important. We have zero hinterland. Uh, unlike any other country in the world, except for maybe a handful, which are very much like Singapore, there is very little option of traveling you know, two hours outside to a large swath of national reserve, a large forest, we actually do have to cross a border, uh, which used to be uh, pre-COVID the busiest border in the whole world. So, uh, but within our 720 square kilometers, we have 6 million trees that we know of that we manage, right? 2 million urban trees, 350 gardens and parks, uh, park connectors, which are wilded areas where people can uh, walk and cycle, but at the same time can be used by flora and fauna as uh, ecological connectors. 
uh, 100 hectares of sky rise greenery amongst the top 10 in the world in terms of uh, area coverage, uh, as well as 1,300 community gardens, which again has taken on uh, a, a lot of significance in, in this uh, past few months, right, when we are struck with COVID and people wanted to do something and we, we were all concerned about things like food security. So all these things have actually uh, allowed us to ride through COVID uh, a little easier than if we were, for example, a city which was nothing but buildings. And, and it was very prescient. It started a long time ago. Uh, and I'll get into that, right? So, so I mean, look at this scene. Uh, you, will, you will rarely find something like this in a city with only 720 square kilometers, uh, with a thriving first world economy, uh, with uh, more than 5 million people inside, right? So, so what does it take for this to happen? Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a long story, but I've tried to distill it into basically three fundamental principles, right? The first thing, like it or not, it took a vision. And this is fairly remarkable. Say what you like about the man, Lee Kuan Yew, from the very earliest days of Singapore's inception, from the time, from before the time we even became a republic, he was really, really committed. He was really, really invested in the idea that greening was an important thing, that having a city within uh, nature was a very, very important thing. Um, there were very few quotes coming from that time about why he felt it was important. The most famous one was that in the mid 1960s, when we were all starting to become republics in Southeast Asia, we wanted a way to distinguish ourselves from everyone else around us and portray to foreign investors, potential foreign investors, that we knew how to do the small things right, which means that if you were able to keep your streets clean, if you were able to manage greenery, if you were, uh, if you, you were able to uh, construct a city which was neat and tidy and green, then everybody would be like, mm, okay, Singapore is different. Singapore knew how to manage stuff and therefore uh, they would come in to invest. It was, it's, it's the most um, visible artifact of, of what he had in his mind when he planted that first tree and, and launched the city, uh, a garden city concept, the garden city vision uh, in the year 1963, two years before we actually became independent, right? But there were a lot of other things that actually um, drove him towards that. The first thing was that in 1965, right after we achieved independence, we realized that um, the green spaces in Singapore were only um, found in certain estates, right? And those were the estates uh, of the rich people, the elites. And Lee Kuan Yew understood that um, greenery and nature was a very low cost way to bring a valuable good, which is basically uh, immersion in nature and the uh, positive health and mental benefits that it brought to society uh, to the rest of Singapore. So uh, he started up the uh, Garden City vision and he brought greenery, nature into the heartlands and into our urban infrastructure very, very early on. And, and this is really very forward thinking, right? So based on that, what next do you need? Um, and this is what Singapore, of course, is well known for doing. It takes a plan, right? So you literally need uh, to really have a framework. You really have to look at your maps and to find out what do you want to conserve? Where do you want to go? Uh, let's look at the ecosystems that you have and conserve them and then how to link them together. So um, plans grow and good plans grow and evolve depending on the changing circumstances uh, of the era that you find yourself in, the social, political, economic circumstances, and even the environmental circumstances. So the plan, which was the Garden City version, uh, vision, actually morphed over several decades and it became the city in a garden vision. It was a slight semantic change, but actually uh, it meant different things altogether. When Singaporeans became richer in the 2000s, uh, we were heading towards the peak of the Maslow Pyramid. Uh, we were looking for different things. Our demographics were changing as well. We were uh, fast becoming an older population. Uh, the needs of people were shifting towards things like, well, nature conservation. What can we do about the nature that we have right now? Rather than simple amenity planting, how do we then uh, bring ecological corridors, bring networks, uh, make Singapore into a highly ecologically connected nation. And that came up. And this year in February, 
And again, something strangely prescient, right? We, we shifted again into a new paradigm, a city in nature. And city in nature was founded on the three new objectives that we felt would determine what Singapore required uh, to make its people feel better, to uh, impart more resilience uh, um, from the year 2020 to the year 2050, right? So, so this, is, this is what determined the new city in nature vision. We wanted our nature and greenery and the networks to basically impart climate resilience, which is a very trendy thing, right? Ecological resilience and social resilience. And this was only announced in February. And right after that, COVID hit. And then we didn't really understand, uh, if you were a member of the public, what social resilience meant. But right after COVID struck, imagine that we had a circuit breaker period where uh, we were not really encouraged to go out uh, to do things, but we could do two things, right? And it was guaranteed. The first thing you could do was to go out and buy supplies, get food, get groceries. That was the first thing you could do, right? Guaranteed. No questions asked. Just wear a mask and go out, practice social distancing. The second thing that the Singapore government allowed you to do during circuit breaker was to go out and exercise in parks. And suddenly you find that a lot of Singaporeans immediately overnight became uh, fitness fanatics, right? They were all going to the parks. The parks became really crowded. But it was lucky that in the year 2020, Singapore looks like this. We had a lot of parks, a lot of greenery, and then we couldn't, we, we found ourselves unable to go elsewhere uh, to enjoy nature and greenery elsewhere. And then suddenly we had to turn around and say, oh, well, we can't travel. What do we have? to visit in Singapore, and there were tons of opportunities, right? So we, we managed to benefit during the COVID period uh, uh, on the foundations, from the foundations that were laid down uh, 40, 50, 55 years ago, which is really remarkable, right? And this is the plan now. The plan now, um, which is very different from what we had before, um, has moved on from greenery into nature. So that plan had seven pillars, uh, four of the top seven uh, uh the top four of these seven pillars has the word nature and ecology into it right so so that's extending our nature park network intensifying nature in our gardens and parks restoring nature into the urban landscape and strengthening connectivity between our green spaces so it's all about really uh going from the manicured look uh into something which is more akin to bringing back our native plants animals habitats ecosystems even in our smallest parks so this is what we are pushing for uh, in, the, in the next 10, 20, 30 years to come. And, and it's very important because of the objectives that I, I, I said before. It, it basically tries to turn Singapore into a thriving tropical urban ecosystem unique amongst uh, the world uh, in which the ecosystem services that we derive benefits from uh, will come to bear in the next 10, 20, 30 years, which uh, segues into the next point. What does it really, really take if you want to rewild a place? And the actual answer there is time. Mother Nature is actually very flexible. Mother Nature is very, very adaptable. Mother Nature is very resilient. However, Mother Nature is extremely patient. Mother Nature is a patient engineer. Um, sometimes it doesn't take a whole lot of time. So um, uh, let's see this example I have here, Bishan Aomokyo Park. The first photo of the upper left, you see Bishan Angmukyo Park when it was a concrete canal in the year 2005. Uh, that second photo, bottom left, uh, was when it first opened. After a four year long development process, it was opened in the year 2012. Right, right now, uh, this was a picture of otters. Uh, last year, 2019, everything has grown in and the otters reappeared by themselves, set up homes, uh, gave birth to babies, and from then on, basically uh, sired uh, whole bunches of families. And now there are 70, uh, at least 70 individuals of authors that came partially from this family that first set up shop in Bishong Amrikyo Park two or three years ago. So it's really remarkable, but it takes time. Other overseas examples, uh, a lot of people hearing this will say, well, it's easy for Singapore, you have a lot of money. Now, given time, uh, the, the, the moral of my story for the, for the left photo is that if you give it enough time, it can be very, very cheap to do so. Very famous man in India, Jada Payeng, he's known as the forest man of India, 
Over 27 years, he single-handedly planted a forest all by himself, just off his village, right? It takes time and it need not be very expensive. Um, the second story is the one to the right, whereby sometimes the impacts of nature coming back to you, uh, you would not know until years after it happened, right? So the reintroduction of wolves back into Yellowstone National Park has resulted over 27 years uh, in them eating the, the, the elk, uh, in then, then the forest regrowing because uh, the elk were, were eating the saplings of little aspen. And then in the end, the rivers were changing, all to the benefit of the greater ecosystem. So the things take time, and I think time is uh, actually the magic ingredient here. And in Singapore, we were able to do so, again, like it or not, because of the very stable uh, environment that we find ourselves having. Right. Over the past 55 years, uh, not just environmentally, uh, socially, uh, no wars, right? Uh, uh, geopolitically, but at the same time, locally, politically also. We did not have changes in government who will then dabble with, well, what if we have more buildings? Uh, it was one political establishment that from day one had its mind focused on building a clean, green and natural city. So that that is actually something that Singapore has that uh, distinguishes Singapore from other places in the world politically. Right? And um, I was told to talk a little bit about challenges in every endeavor that you set up, uh, in everything that you walk a journey 55 years, there will always be challenges, right? So this is the most obvious challenge that we find ourselves. We are too good at this game, right? So what is the drawback of being too good at reintroducing nature back into Singapore? Human wildlife interaction, right? Uh, Again, the story of the otters, they used to be here. They were extirpated uh, many decades back. We naturalized and we did not reintroduce them. They came back on their own. And now we have over 70 individuals uh, and they become celebrated, right? They are actually fairly bold little critters. Um, they are good to look at. They are extremely cute. And in 2015, they were held up uh, as icons of, uh, uh, of Singapore. Right, so uh, BBC had a poll about what 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 made uh, Singapore Singapore, and the otter family uh, was 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 up. Uh, but this year, because of the COVID, uh, people were staying at home. They were observing these things more, and they realized that the otters sometimes came into people's houses and ate their ornamental fish. Some of which uh, cost upwards of fourteen thousand dollars, and some of which belonged to celebrities. So when that happened, it made the news. And when it made the news, uh, I was actually fairly shocked to go on to certain forums to find out that there were actually people in Singapore saying that they were pests and they should be killed, right? So these are the things that we have to grapple with. There are obviously other challenges. For example, the more naturalistic your environment is, the more people will be frightened of things that bring this amenity, mosquitoes, snakes. Not everybody is a convert. Not everybody likes nature. And that's the last of my slides. And we can have a further discussion on uh, how these things uh, present themselves as challenges uh, further Thank on. You Thank so you so much, Jen. That's a fantastic foundation. Now moving on to Lauren. Thank you. I think the, the floor is mine now. Sarah, I'm not sure if you wanted to to speak there and uh, say anything in the middle, but I'm uh, always really happy to, to follow and humbled to follow Singapore's example. We're just, sorry to be clear, we're just gonna flow directly from presentation to presentation. So feel free. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Okay. Confirm, just confirming that. So um, I I have the benefit of, as Sarah said, being in Singapore um, and uh, enjoying many decades of planning and execution here. In fact, when I closed my eyes, I was thinking of the smell of frangipanis and seeing monitor lizards because that was the last uh, interaction I had when a little baby monitor lizard was creeping out of the drain the other day as I was biking with my daughter to her school. So um, 
not a typical uh, uh, animal to see. But um, what, what we do is really to work with cities to aggregate experiences and empower cities to make these kinds of changes like we're talking about that have happened in Singapore, some at a small scale and some at a large scale. And so um, I'm gonna share some examples. Before I do that, I'm just gonna talk for a couple of minutes about who we are. So we are the only network of cities focused on urban resilience. And when we talk about resilience, it includes climate, includes environment, but it also very explicitly focuses on physical, social, and economic challenges and building resilience of cities to be stronger in the face of all of those challenges that as we've seen this year in particular, are a growing part of the 21st century. Our network is city led and we're regionally driven and impact focused, which means that our cities set the agenda for our work uh, each and every year. Our program builds on about 10 years of investment in creating resilience methods for cities to use uh, that were provided by the Rockefeller Foundation. And some of you may have been familiar with the previous program that was called 100 Resilient Cities. Um, and to date, we have 97 cities in our network. We work across six continents in 27, sorry, in 21 languages and in 47 countries. And we're So how do we work with cities? We work with cities in very specific Resilience uh, is in particular the way we define it as the capacity for everyone from individual citizens up to city institutions to respond and survive and thrive in the face of those social, economic, and environmental challenges. That's a bold and broad definition. So we need to focus with our cities on the ways. So we do that first and foremost by empowering cities with knowledge. And part of doing that is the examples that I'll share with you today. And we work with our 97 cities, but we also include a much broader community of cities. Um, and if you're interested in learning more, I would welcome you to come onto our website, join some of our communities of practice. They're open um, and we share knowledge very openly with cities, both within and outside of our network. We also work specifically with cities in our network on implementing multi-city programs. So in the context of um, urban greening, for example, many of our cities are working together in a community around urban heat. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about those examples later. And then finally, we mobilize finance for cities. So we help cities to identify finance to fund their resilience projects. Now, Let's talk about some examples of going wild. Um, and this is an example, it's one of my favorites from the city of Paris. Um, and Paris, when they came into the Resilient Cities Network, they were focused on climate change. Um, this was in uh, 2014, at the end of 2014. And then 2015, and there was the Charlie Hebdo incident and a number of very troubling issues in Paris neighborhoods uh, that were conflicts between different races and ethnicities. Um, and at the same time, Paris started to experience some of the hottest summers on record, not Paris alone, but all of Europe. And I think you have all remembered some of those summers watching the, watching the mercury rise and looking at temperatures that were higher in Europe than they were, say, here in, in many of our Southeast Asian cities. And so Paris realized that they were dealing with compounding crises, one with regard to social inclusion, one with regard to climate, um, and access to community cohesion spaces. And so what Paris decided to do was to design an intervention to essentially rewild and green creating heat oasis schoolyards in Paris. So the city had control over its schools because having the ability to make this change fast was a priority for the city. Um, and they have already piloted this program in 12 different schools in Paris where they've essentially torn up the asphalt, planted trees, created shade, and replaced those pavements with planters, 
with more installations for children, benches for community members to sit. And they made a very simple change, which was to open those schoolyards after hours and on the weekends and have them as spaces where community members could gather. Now, an interesting fact about schools in Paris is that no community member lives more than 200 meters uh, from a school. So this really increased access to green space for Parisians and in particular for vulnerable populations. An example from, oops, going a little too quickly there, from much closer to where we are uh, sitting and standing this afternoon. And that's in Chennai in India. Um, so in Chennai, as um, many may very hot temperatures and potential droughts, um, but Chennai also faces severe flooding risk. So the city wanted to come up with a solution that would offer the potential to absorb heat, also to absorb water. And in many of Chennai's schools, a lot of the children in particular from low and low middle income families, they count on their schools to provide midday meals to provide them with healthy food. And so Chennai was looking for a solution to multiple challenges. How do we cool our city? How do we create more shade? Um, and how do we produce food? Effort to address these multiple effects of this growing urban population in Chennai, Chennai has started an urban horticulture initiative to promote the creation of rooftop vegetable gardening. And so again, the city looked for buildings that it had access to and could make a change and identified schools as a place to pilot this initiative. They discovered then an initial multiple benefit for this program, which was that they could integrate these rooftop gardens into the curriculum for schools. And they could bring community members into the schools to help tend the garden and teach children about healthy food, gardening and composting. Now, a, a final example that also touches that cross, um, that crosswalk, that nexus between food and urban greening is urban farming in Quito. Now, Quito realized that sitting on a fault line, their food supply was vulnerable. Um, and so they wanted to create more sources of food around the city so that if their central roads were cut off due to an earthquake, they would be able to rely on multiple markets around the city to provide healthy food. At the same time, Quito has a high number of um, low and low middle income families, and they were able to, many of these families, to come in and start urban farms and they have now been able to create over 1,500 urban farms around the city that contribute to resilience. Now, this came in especially handy, not because of an earthquake, but because of COVID-19. So instead of many people having markets, and there was that discussion before about what were the first things you needed to do, even during lockdown, right? You needed to mask up and go to a market. More central. Now, because Quito had created thousands of farmers and then micro market sites, they could actually divide the city more successfully into zones and people could access food in many of them out settings, which we know have less risk for COVID 19. So, in this case, this access to food and safer access to food in the face of the pandemic this year. So I hope that those three examples gives on types of projects that can help to rewild green a city uh, and offer multiple benefits because I think as this year has taught us, there's a lot of uncertainty and our cities are facing many different challenges. So when we look at identify what they are and solutions that can address multiple challenges, we will end up with high
higher levels of benefit and higher levels of resilience in times of trouble. Wonderful. Thanks Looking so much. Looking forward to the discussion. Thanks so much for articulating that. Uh, next up, Hyun, the, uh, the mic is yours. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, so today's topic is going to be on rewilding the mind from my side, a new scope of seeing landscape design. The city is the largest artifact created by human. The city has developed spontaneously and without order. It still exists as a faithful reflection of human desires and the collective subconsciousness. This is a quote by Taro Igarashi, an architectural critic and historian. We are currently 7.7 .7 billion in population. 55% of us are living in the city. Our revolution is intensely concentrated in the cities. The history of humanity as defined by historian anthropologist Yuva Noah Harari undergoes three major revolutions. Connective revolution started 70,000 years ago. We started to be able to recognize self and our environment. Religion, philosophy, and art assisted us to anchor the flux of our humanity. In 2002, we decoded our genome and we are aware what biologically made of us. 12,000 years ago, we went through agriculture revolution. We switched from hunter-gatherers lifestyle to the start of domesticating nature, controlling of nature, and the separation from nature. Struggling with this departure, Mass agriculture goes on a tug of war with wisdom in balancing nature and our food supply. 500 years ago, science started to offer knowledge and logic to our life. With science came technology. With technology came convenience and comfort. The fall of the God King, the arrival of enlightenment and industrialization breed many utopian notions. More and more, we are becoming the machines that we have created. A departure from nature seems to be glorifying and praising us as an intelligent species. CRISPR-Cas9 has allowed us to edit our own gene. We have broken free from the gravity of our Earth. Our machine has left our solar system. Let 207, 700 million years away are hidden in our underground bunkers. This fire that leaves us from nature has given us the power and control. Or are we purely the hubris that we have created? Our house is on fire, burned by the same fire. Our icebergs are sweating. Cryosphere is melting. Many life forms are charred. The phoenix may not rise again with the uncertainty of positive feedback. The mass extinction is approaching. The ification of humanity has turned into a depauperated environment. Is it the fault of technology? In northeastern north Siberia, the Pleistocene Park by maverick scientist Zimov, who besides trying to de-extinct the mammoth, uses all Soviet tanks to mimic the megafauna's action of knocking down tree stumps. This helped to prevent emission of greenhouse gas. Machine and technology seem not to be the fault of our environmental crisis. In the early 19th century, the phenomenon of human-induced climatic change was described by Alexander von Humboldt. Ernst Haeckel coined the term ecology around the same time. In 1859, Charles Darwin beat Wallace to publish the theory of evolution in his book on the origin of species. This set us to think about our relationship with the rest of the living organism. Survival of the fittest, being rather capitalist in concept, was challenged by Peter Kropotkin, a Russian scientist who proposed his theory of mutual aid as the force of evolution. The term biophilia was popularized by Edward O. Wilson in 1984. Biophilia hypothesis questioned the common perspective that nature is love for her benefits to us. To Silent Spring in 1962, Rachel Carlson spreads the science of ecology to the public. 
So David Eidenberg recently has beaten everyone to the fastest to be the fastest to reach one million followers in Instagram. Good on him. Greta Thunberg, Greenpeace, Bjork, more and more of us are raising awareness to the adversity of Anthropocene on our environment. Yet the people that are trying to save us is branded as disruptive and knee-jerk alarmist. Their accusers, the climate barbarians, have caused an ego-anxious generation. Are we being good ancestors? A quote, a beautiful quote by Yona Sok, a virologist. Cities are changing. The fatigue and exhaustion caused by Anthropocene are surfacing. On one hand, we know that in Dark Factory and on Mars, the machine can now exist pretty much without us. Yet, they can survive even without Elon Musk, to be frank. On the other hand, we know that post-anthropocene can be one of co-evolution among the rest of the living things, the machines and us. In 2012, Singapore is designated in A plus U magazine as the capital city for vertical green. This is a continuum from the late PM Lee Kuan Yew's Garden City. The green emblematic implications accumulate from one monument to the next and become increasingly overt in Singapore. Triggered and accelerated by COVID-19, Minister Desmond Lee has just announced that Singapore is approaching a city in nature. Salad dressing being situated in the city-state of Singapore, of course, is, is inspired by this movement. We started rewilding the sky. Our office garden is sited at the cantilever structure of the old turf club. We rewound native tree frog, a pathogenic frog, a uh, pathogenic lizard, sorry about that, stick insects into the garden of 400 species and varieties of plants. Currently, we are trying to introduce luminous mushroom to our garden. Around the same time, we work on another project with Wuha, <clears throat> the enabling village which is located in the HDB heartland of Bukit Mera. This is a rewilding project that is brought to an urban center by a semi-private organizer. We are currently working on Sing uh, Singapore development by a private uh, stakeholder. Certain sections of the roof gardens will be rewilded. Gradually, rewilding and biophilia is resonating across the country's different sector. We attempt to put ecology as foreground, focusing on genotype apart from our usual phenotypical readings, rewilding water with different aquatic ecosystems beyond phytoremediation. This can be new scopes of landscape design that will rewild the mind. This is a rewilding the sky project that my team hoped to build. Here, a non-blood-sucking mosquito and a detritus consumption pitcher plant are bred in a protected rooftop that features a heat forest garden. The two has a certain symbiotic relationship. Once a month, some of these two vegans will be released into the wild. They have both been persecuted due to speciesism on blood sucking mosquitoes. My office now tries to be vegan once a week. Eight years ago, we started working on a project in Sabah, Borneo. It is finishing this year. A Malaysia project does go that long. Because of this duration, we got the chance to constantly return to Borneo, not only for the project, but for a deeper understanding of our equator's very own unique natural landscape, the rainforest. We started to see the environmental relationship beyond those of a given project sites, the biogeography of bigger scale and the transmutable effect from ecology to one of climatic became the center focus of our work. We are situated approximately at the middle of Earth's Hadley cell. Rain is supposed to be abundant and almost consistent, only minorly affected by the northeast and southwest monsoon. Yet, with the recent south oscillation fluctuation, deforestation, and increase in atmospheric carbon, the heating up of the sea and the land have distressed even the rainfall of the equator. 
For next year's Venice Architecture Biennale, we came up with a piece on rewilding the sky, rewilding our rooftop, and rewilding the troposphere for rain. Bukit Timah, which is situated in the central west of Singapore, triggers more rain for in the west than the east. We propose a city in the west that echoes the effect of Bukit Timah Hill's bioprecipitation ability to calm, call down the rain. The rain harvesting forest city uses orographic effect, ice nucleating pseudomonas bacteria and acting as a biotic pump. Not only will assist to fill up our 2050s proposed reservoirs in the south, it will also bring rain into Malayan Peninsula. Here, nature succession and rewilding will take over the new aesthetic and principle. Since all this metamorphosis, we have metaphorically been blaming on other living things to express the hidden darkness of the social earth. Our current social belief of survival of the fittest is not an evidence of the animal in us. Instead, biophilia is the resonance of the animal earth. Are we at a fragmented one point or are we shared entity? Thank you. Thank you very much um, for raising such cosmic issues to our conversation. Um, Prof Wang, the, the mic is yours. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay, okay, great, yeah. <laughs> All right, yeah, thanks. Uh, so um, thank you for the, this invitation that I'm, I'm really honored to uh, share the, what I'm doing it here. So, and also the, well, since the time is limited, so I, I just want to keep it short of all the things and then maybe we wanted to have some more discussion later. So um, my name is Yoon He, so I'm teaching in the landscape architecture in the National University of Singapore. So as a landscape researcher, um, my role is to really link the bridge uh, between the relevant academic knowledge and uh, practical interest toward the real world application. So uh, that is uh, what I'm interested in too. So uh, I'm currently leading uh, several research projects uh, related to the, this uh, today's topic, Going Wild uh, Singapore. So you could find more about the uh, ongoing project and ongoing research work uh, through this QR code, so you can see uh, later. Today, I just want to share that um, the rise. I, I just want to uh, share some of the my topics related to the, this uh, going wild Singapore through the lens of the four fundamental urban ecological principles, which um, were taken from the literature review uh, published by the many uh, urban ecologists. So mainly there are four um, the main principles. One is uh, maintain heterogeneity, and second is accommodate uh, dynamics. And third one is functioning fun function ecological ecosystems connected at the nested scale and fourth is a uh, social and ecological uh, process or interweaving so it's just simple for a principle but there are a lot of the uh, stories and a lot of the um, theories is in inside so uh, just quick uh, share with you about through the, our uh, project 
so first one is um, um, the uh, accommodate uh, and maintain the he uh, heterogeneity. So as you know, this uh, through the, this uh, Jim's uh, project, um, Jim's presentation, uh, more than four, fifty percent of the Singapore land surface are already covered by the green. So um, they're gonna be expected to grow more because of this uh, very uh, um, the active uh, initiative in the city in the, uh, nature. So uh, I believe that this is gonna be growing more and more and probably we have a, we will keep the, this like more than 50% of the green in the, in the Singapore, although we have a lot of plan for the human development and the uh, commercial development. Uh, but the, in the in terms of looking at the detail, uh, there is two extreme uh, characteristic of the green space. One is like managed green space, and the other one is unmanaged vegetation. So unmanaged one definitely is about the forest, which we just have a little remain one, and also some of the this uh, secondary forest, which are waiting for the uh, uh, development, like unnamed forest. So they are more toward this nature and history uh, in a sense. And uh, whereas at the other uh, extreme is an uh, urban park uh, and also ma highly maintained uh, vegetation area that it's more accommodated this noble ecosystems and also more human uh, dominated um, the nature in inside of the, this uh, city. So uh, we, I thought that it's it's a lot of potentials to make a new typologies and new alternative nature. So probably there is a, a lot of room to having a, this uh, in between two extremes. So for example, uh, we had a design studio in the uh, last year uh, called that it's rewilding Singapore. So we explore all the diff all the like green space typology, existing green space typology to convert into the diff transform into the from the manicure into the more vibrant landscape. So like rewilding waterway and rewilding urban park and also rewilding golf course, playground, the streetscape, industrial landscape, even shopping malls and under viaduct. There is a lot of um, the opportunity in the many, many uh, open space. So this kind of the approach uh, can make a, a city to having a more maintained this heterogeneity too. So um, the more detail is uh, recently published, uh, you can find it in the recently published article in the Rewilding Singapore in the City Green Magazine. So this is one. Second one is uh, accommodate uh, dynamics. So the um, I would like to share the, this uh, my naturalized garden in the, our school campus that was uh, initiated uh, from the clear mown lawn and then um, let the spontaneous vegetation grow over years and then added a uh, landscape element with the very selective maintenance activities. So the such kind of opportunity uh, really suggests that alternative timeline that allow the maturation of the landscape and also flexible uh, human activity by the, this uh, calibrating timeline makes uh, something uh, unique as well as to ex kind of explore the new type of the, um, the landscapes. So uh, we're looking at this uh, typical construction process for the built environment in Singapore in many other cities too. So age of the building of the Singapore maybe just 50 years at most. But while the nature um, itself is growing beyond like 100 years and maybe it's beyond our uh, timeline, I'm mean, a uh, human timeline. So the uh, how it looks like the uh, Bishan Park after 100 years or how it look like all our nature uh, which recently, I mean, which uh, 50 years ago just recently built it, how it looks like in the after hundred years. So probably this is kind of like a, a bold question that we wanted to shape or we wanted to uh, ask by ourselves too. So, and the other question is, can we active, actively utilize this uh, dynamic vegetation growth as a part of the design process? Uh, well, conventional design process didn't really including the this one as a part of that they think that this is kind of management aspect but i believe that the understanding this uh, all the this vibrant uh, growth 
in the short term and long term change of the vegetation pattern uh, would help us to uh, guide a little bit more toward this uh, better uh, landscape in, in relation with this uh, urban wild. The third one is um, functioning uh, ecosystem connected at the nested scale. So surely the denser and complex and multi-tiered landscapes based on the, this urban wild approach enable to provide more functional ecosystem service, including the habitat formations, soil decompositions, and the carbon uh, sequestrations, infiltration rate definitely, and temperature reductions, which uh, Roran already shared, uh, and also noise reductions. There are a lot of the functions that which we can accommodate and we can uh, really uh, try to uh, prove that or to demonstrate that what is the function which can combine or which can accommodate together with the, this urban wild approach gonna help us to make a more decision makers to help, uh, help to uh, decided this approach to apply in the uh, real world. So another point is that uh, to consider the nature at the multiple scales. So beyond this isolated cosmetic greening, for example, like um, let's say we are designing the green roof, uh, probably starting from the soil compositions, we may talk about this, uh, the composition of the soil organisms. Uh, and then after that, maybe it's about the uh, nearer tree, nearby tree, that was the large tree, and then near the forest area or near area for the which can be work as a stepping stone. And also the moving forward, like as a part of the ecological network across the nation. So even in the very single small scale of the landscape can be work as a nested scale. So it would be great having this comprehensive vision uh, to, to own the greening uh, uh, city. So this is a uh, uh, third approach that I want to emphasize it. Last one is a social and ecological process or interweaving. So the social and cultural aspect, uh, there are many mixed feeling that about the urban wild, maybe people think it's messy or it has a lot of mosquitoes comes and but there is a, a lot of the uh, ongoing newspapers to talking about the surprised by the this abundance of the wild flowers on the green birds during the, this lockdown period. And people may think that what work in the forest may not work in the, our garden. And we like butterflies, but we don't like caterpillars. Um, and there are many, many kind of the urban wild really highly dependent on the context that, for example, like if there is a like a grass lalang field that which is very messy, but uh, it, it regarded as a kind of cute neglect. But uh, that is also kind of good uh, background for the wedding wedding uh, shot. So the which means it's about the how to make or how to many how to um, manipulate our urban wild. It's kind of the good. Uh, I, I mean, this is uh, what's the what's the, our law as a designers or researchers and also decision makers. And the other one is uh, there are several uh, social study and perception study. What I made it. Uh, there is some little uh, uh, interim conclusion is that. The accepted uh, degree of the wildness, maybe there is a varies, it depending on the context. And also probably we can find out certain level of the acceptance if the degree of the intensity of the maintenance is, can be controlled by us. And there is a, some of the cue to care and there are some of the cue to neglect and there are some of the associate uh, landscape element which we can using in. So there is many uh, practical points that which we can make as a research uh, approach and research topics. And the other point is that uh, currently what I'm trying to do it is about the life cycling as, uh, analysis of the less manicured landscape. So which connect with the, this uh, cost aspect and also the economic aspect and that may help the, again, for the decision making, and also there are some of the uh, trade-off between the biodiversity and uh, messy uh, appearance, uh, perhaps the economic value versus this um, the the pest control uh, aspect, and also there's many way to think of that. What's the priority and what's the weightage which we can make it, and also there are some of the trade-off uh, this 
trade-off um, the condition and conversation which we can also rise it and probably the choice experimental survey is going to be useful for the, this timing too so this is one thing that I'm, I'm trying to uh, prepare it so in some um, there's a, I mean, this is all the worthwhile uh, topic to discuss by different stakeholder groups and a lot of rooms for research and practice to be applied uh, toward this ecological, sustainable and uh, resilience uh, Singapore. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, all of you had such rich sharings that I didn't want to cut you off, but that has meant that we actually have very limited time for conversation. Lauren, I don't know if you want to, if you're able to join us by switching on your camera again. So on the topic of time, <laughs> Hoyun said, our house is on fire. We have a very limited window with it, which to act if our culture as we know it is to survive. But Jim started out by telling us that these things take time. And you you has just talked about how, you know, imagining these things unfolding over a century's time. So I just wanted to do a quick fire round, starting with Jim, to say, these things take time, but the house is on fire. What, what co one concrete step can either policymakers or citizens take to accelerate the reincorporation of nature into our urban landscapes? I'd love to hear one quick response from everyone, starting with Jim, please. Well, Singapore is already doing it. Um, and it's uh, something fairly strategic. Uh, it's got nothing to do with bringing nature back actively. Passively, we have the lowest birth rate in the world. And, and, and if you are looking at David Attenborough's Netflix documentary, the main thing about saving the world because it's on fire <laughs> is to reduce the human footprint. There you go. <laughs> Newsworthy. Well, Okay, top of that. Um, any of the other speakers have, have thoughts on this? Maybe from the perspective of a landscape architect or? But since I'm the one that said the house is on fire, actually it's not even by me because it's a, it's a recent book by Greta Thunberg. The title is The House is on Fire. Um, well, time is, 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 is something that's really subjective to everyone. I think the main thing when we say the house is on fire is to call upon consciousness. Um, I, I, I would like to say this. Uh, I don't think we will have a sustainability issue. Um, there, are, there are many ways to deal with the climatic change. Um, if, if, you, if you just tune on to uh, Stewart Brand, uh, who talks about the extinction, there are, there are many ways to, to actually reduce uh, the, the issues that we have as a species living on Earth. Um, I think what we are starting to talk down here is that um, we, 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 we are not concerned about other species. Um, we're not trying to work with them out to resolve this issue. Uh, ecological issue is, in fact, less being focused than climatic issue for one very simple reason. It doesn't make much money at this moment. It doesn't. We know that you know, neoclassical economic will carry on as we move into this uh, 2030. And it's not easy to resolve it. But I think what I'm trying to urge everyone to do is to kind of take notice of, uh, well, let's say the palm sievert, or you know, to have a bit more consciousness of the night jar in the night that is calling or you know, to be aware of the existence of other kind of living things. Um, you know, so hedgehogs are, are not in Singapore, but they are really my daughter's favorite. And um, yeah, every, every single creature, it, it, it's, it's evolution in, in other words. We, we, we do have an evolution of evolution at this moment because we do know how evolution has evolved in the past, uh, past few years that, uh, well, less than 100 over years that we, we figure this out. So could you, Sorry, okay, I know it's, it's such a big topic. I wish we weren't constrained by time ourselves. Uh, I, I'm afraid it looks like we've lost Lauren. So Ralph Huang, do you have any, um, any parting thoughts in terms of what you would like to see happen right now to help accelerate this necessary transformation? Well, um, 
I guess we are in the really like unpredictable kind of the age we are. I mean, we are in the this uh, kind of era. We are living it. So, but again, it's a uh, because of this uh, all the different party has a different um, aspect about to how to apply the, this uh, uh, rewilding concept in the city. So I believe that uh, uh, some of the so I mean we we are the kind of frontier to really uh, pushing the this boundary. So I believe that all of us, I mean, in, in the, this room, uh, once we are aware of this and we are really, really wanted to explore the, this alternative of the uh, possibility, I believe that uh, uh, it's going to be uh, more uh, happen to make a more positive aspect and positive uh, movement toward this um, uh, Singapore. So there is a lot of room. I mean, I believe that is the potential is a lot. Thank you so much for ending that on a positive note. I would just add to that the need for all of the different parts of the human ecosystem to talk and collaborate with each other, which is why we intentionally on this call have a representative government, academia, civil society, and private practice. Um, so let's keep building this ecosystem together uh, towards the resilient uh, society and cities that we need. All of the speaker's presentations will be made available for download uh, from the World City platform. Uh, we're not gonna have a live round of applause, but I'm certainly um, so grateful to all of you uh, for giving your time and sharing your wisdom with us today. Um, and also thank you to the organizers of the conference, including Tom, who's been working behind the scenes uh, to support us. Um, stay safe, everyone, be well, uh, let's do this. Okay, right. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.